Did y'all see my brother? Sharp dresser. Good looking guy. It was a joke. It was me. It's been a rough week. It's been a hard week, I think. You see all sorts of stuff. We've talked about it. You see stuff on the news that's disheartening. You see things in your life that's disheartening. Uh, I think Wednesday, was it? Maybe Tuesday? Uh, we were having a meeting, and I was about two-thirds of the way through writing my sermon. And uh, we had a meeting, uh, some staff members, and we were just talking about how uh, discouraging the week was and how exhausted we were and how we didn't know anymore even what to pray for, really. And so at the end of that meeting, uh, some just really good time together to, to kind of talk about how we need to lament and how we need to, to weep. But also I recognized I probably need to rewrite my sermon, uh, which was fine because I didn't like it anyway. Um, so it was good. It was good, good for me. Um, but it's discouraging. And uh, it, it reminded me as I was, as I was spending my week uh, thinking about this, there's, uh, as you all know, I like baseball, and then there's this uh, kind of a this week in history that I saw, and uh, it was uh, this week in history in 1957, uh, there was a Phillies player named Richie Ashburn, and he later on went to become a, a broadcaster, but he was a player, and he was uh, at, at the plate, and pitch comes in, he swings and hits a foul ball, line drive, into the stands, and hit a woman in the face and broke her nose. And so they all stop, and they, they get her on a stretcher, and they start to take her out, and play resumes. And on the very next pitch, he hits another foul ball into the stands and hits her and breaks her leg. And I'm like, it's like that scene in The Jerk. Somebody's after these cans. I, I, I laughed for a long time at that story. And then I realized, like, that's kind of how I feel. I feel like every time I open up the news, it's just foul balls, like just blitzing into the stands. And we're all getting hit with them. And plays just kind of keep going. Like, nobody's stopping. Nobody's, nobody's helping. It's just kind of just keep going, you know? Like, we're just expected to proceed with life, you know, as, as normal. Get you out on a stretcher. It's fine. Turn off your news browser if you want to go hide somewhere. Go feed an addiction and come back when you're ready. And it can feel incredibly daunting. And what it can feel like is that we are not capable. We can't make any kind of an impact. We can't change anything. And we're stuck. It can feel incredibly disheartening to see the news and be like, I'm only one person. What can I do? What can I do? We started this series called uh, All Things New. We started this, uh, writing this series back in the summer when it looked like the fall really would be all things new. It kind of feels like it's the same. So today we're talking about an all new purpose and I want to look at it a little bit differently. We're in Philippians uh, chapter 1. And this is going to be a larger chunk of Scripture, but we kind of, I kind of trimmed it down. Because I want to focus on 1, 18 to 21. And I want to answer the question, how can we make a difference? And not a difference in the world, but a difference in our world, in our area, the people around us. So let's look at verse 18. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So let's talk about four ways, four ways that Paul mentions here that we can make a difference. Four ways. Before we get to that, though, I want to talk about what's going on in the situation. Paul's writing to a group of believers that he absolutely adores. He loves the Philippian church. They're incredibly supportive. They're good to him. When he takes up a collection for things, they give. It's pretty amazing. They've been very supportive. Even though he had a hard time in Philippi, he ran into some trouble there. He still loves this church, this body of believers. But now Paul is in a situation where they can't help. They're in, he's in Rome, and they're in Philippi. And so Amazon didn't exist back then, so they can't really ship anything to him. Can't give him a care package. All they have are letters. And so Paul's in Rome. He's in house arrest. He's imprisoned, and he may never see them again. And they're discouraged. And so in this little sliver of his, mess, of his, of his letter to them, they, he's, getting, he's giving them encouragement, saying, no, 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 this isn't a bad thing. This is going to work out, and you guys are still really helpful. You can help me. 
Look what he says, again, verse 19, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Now, what does he mean by deliverance? What's he talking about here? Does he mean like, I'm gonna get out of jail? Probably not. Does he mean that no matter what happens, whether I live or I die, whether I'm executed or whether I'm set free, I'm going to be delivered because Christ conquered death and I'm going to be delivered because that, that's a good interpretation. That's in bounds. But one commentator I read this week that I really liked is Paul is being delivered from fear, anxiety, and worry. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. His job, his purpose, his mission in life is to go and preach to the Gentiles. Now, he's about to wind up in a court, a Roman court, the capital of the biggest uh, uh, Gentile empire to date at that time. And he's going to wind up in there and he's... He wants the stage. He wants the opportunity to proclaim Christ crucified. And his deliverance is deliverance from fear, anxiety, and worry. Fear that he won't proclaim the gospel. Anxiety that he'll soft pedal the gospel because he'll want to try and get out of jail. He's wanting deliverance from those anxieties so he can make the most of the opportunity that he's been given. And he's saying, I think all this stuff is working together to actually set me free from these fears and these worries. He believes that all this is going to work out in the end. He thinks that all of this is going to come together like some perfect plan so that he can proclaim the gospel on the biggest stage he's been given. He's not, he doesn't want to waste this opportunity. And many of us engage and approach our life in the same way. We don't want to waste the opportunities that we've been given. We desire significance. We desire meaning. And all that's fine under the umbrella of Christ. I need that kind of hope. You do too. Whatever you're facing, whether it's personal issues, corporate issues, global issues, we have the opportunity to trust God with our future and entrust him to make something significant out of it. So let's talk about these four ways that we can make a difference. The first one is to keep on praying. Verse 19, for I know that through your prayers. Now notice this is not Paul's prayers. This isn't Paul praying for himself. He's talking about the Philippians praying for him. He's saying that I know through your prayers, this is gonna work out. I know through your prayers, my deliverance is gonna take place. I know that through your prayers, I'm not gonna be ashamed. Through your, he's counting on their prayers. He's depending on them. Did you know that we have brothers and sisters in Afghanistan right now? Fellow believers who are terrified, rightfully so, and they are counting on our prayers. They are depending on us for prayer. There's Haitian pastors who are looking at the rubble of the houses of their congregants, and they have limited to no resources to help families rebuild. And they're counting on our prayers to supply them. Should we give other things? Of course we should. But we can't give anything until we pray. I have to pray. I've got to lift these places up. These people, there are doctors and nurses who are watching people die from a pandemic. And despite their best efforts, people keep dying. And they need our prayer. They're counting on our prayers. So why don't we pray more? Why don't we pray more? Is it because we think prayer is ineffective? I think some of us actually think that. I think some of us believe that God's just going to do whatever he wants to do, and it doesn't matter what we pray. And we label it under some kind of cute uh, theological doctrine like Calvinism, or I'm Reformed. That's not Reformed theology. That's not Calvinism. Calvin was a devout man of prayer. He believed in prayer. What you're talking about isn't Calvinism. It's atheism. Prayers are effective. Maybe we're too busy. Maybe we're just too busy. We, we're we're a, a, a people, uh, as a church, this is what we are. We are go-getters. We want to accomplish things. We want to knock things out. And because that's how we are, we're so task-driven that we don't stop to pray. We had a great uh, event in here on Wednesday. It was the Back to School Blast. And it was so cool to see everybody. We didn't do it last year. Uh, uh, and so it was great to just see everybody working and working together. And we had like over here, we had you could put together uniforms. And back here, I think we had teacher care boxes. And back here was some other stuff. And it was really neat. And then over here, right down here, 
was a series of green tables and a wall of students' names. And this was the prayer section. And every other section was like a beehive, just going. And over here, there was, there was just a few people. And so we got to thinking, we're like, maybe it's unclear what you're supposed to do over here, because it could be kind of strange to sit over here and try and be quiet to pray while people are busy. So let's, let's, let's come up here and, and explain what you're supposed to do. And so somebody came up here and explained and said, hey, can I have your attention real quick? We're going to talk about what the prayer area is. Just stop what you're doing real quick, and let's talk about prayer. And you know what everybody did? I kept working. Now, again, I understand that I'm picking on people who came to serve. I can give you Jeff's email if you're upset. <laughs> but I think that's incredibly indicative of our hearts. The great thing about this place is that we are people that want to help. We want to get our hands dirty. We want to get in there. And I love that about this place. But the dark side of that is we are so busy we will not pray. And we've got to change that. Prayer is the most important thing you can do for someone. Before you do anything else, prayer is the most important thing that you can do. So how do you pray? What do you pray? A lot of us maybe don't know how to pray. Well, Paul gives us some suggestions in his letters. In Philippians 4, 6, he says, don't be anxious. Let your requests be made known to God. So there we go. We can pray that people wouldn't be fearful. And we can pray bold prayers for people. Make our requests known. Be creative. Be imaginative. You want to pray for people in Afghanistan and for the church in Afghanistan? Make it where they can't find any Christians. If you want to do them harm, why don't we pray that the church all of a sudden just becomes invisible? Everybody knows where it is, but nobody that wants to do it harm can find it. Sounds like a crazy prayer. God does crazy things. Be bold in your prayers. Don't just be domesticated and tame. Be wild in your prayers. Pray according to scripture, of course. But be creative. Colossians 4, 2, he says to continue steadfastly in prayer with thanksgiving. Be grateful for our brothers and sisters across the globe and keep praying for them. Don't just pray once and be like, oh, I prayed for Afghanistan. Well, that's great, but keep praying. There's a story that Jesus gives about a widow who kept bothering a judge and finally the judge gave him what he wanted, gave her what he wanted. And he says, your father in heaven loves you way more than that judge loves that woman. Don't you think he'll answer your prayers? Be persistent. 1 Corinthians 1, 11 talks about being delivered from death and in that being taught to rely on God. Pray that God would teach us to rely on him as we face difficulties, as we face challenges. Pray that God would deliver our brothers and sisters from death. But more importantly, that he would deliver them from the, the temptation to give up on the faith, to save their own lives. And may we pray the same for ourselves. This isn't all the ways you can pray for people, but this is a great place to start. It should keep you busy for a while. One other thing that Paul mentions here is depending on the Spirit. Let's talk about this. Depending on the Spirit, verse 19. And the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. So this word help in, in the passage is, is probably actually uh, provision. And the provision that Paul's talking about isn't like the Spirit of God providing something. The Spirit of God is the provision. He is the one who is this gift that Paul has been given. And, and it's the Spirit of God who's empowering. It's the Spirit of God who gives him endurance, gives him encouragement, is going to take this opportunity that he has and make it into something worthwhile. Because what, you, what do you know about Paul? Paul planted churches. Paul was busy. Paul was all about getting around the country. And imagine, like, being on house arrest. You can't go and, and, and plant churches. I can imagine Paul would be, like, on his dark days being like, God, this is such a waste of time. Like, I could be out there starting churches. Picture Paul getting kind of wild and crazy and like, you know, having a bulletin board and, his, and like tying strings to it and getting a little conspiracy theorist. And he's like, wait, calm down, it's okay. But he's counting on the Holy Spirit to make this time of inactivity fruitful and meaningful and powerful. And you know what he did, the Spirit of God did with that time? We have a whole bunch of letters from Paul that we call scripture now because the Spirit of God made that time fruitful. And what we need to be careful of doing as we talk about wanting to make a difference, I want to make a difference. As believers, we need to back off that a little bit. We need to change our language around that. We need to say, I want the Spirit of God to make a difference through me. Now you might say, well, Travis, that's semantics. I'm a preacher. I make my living with semantics. But it's also true. It's true. 
Because who gets the glory? I'm making a difference or the Spirit of God making a difference through me? We're acknowledging that the Spirit does the work. The Spirit's the one who accomplishes things. The Spirit's the one who makes it happen. The Spirit's the one that takes the mustard seed and makes it into a tree of faith. The Spirit of God is the one who takes the the five loaves and the two fish and makes a banquet out of it. It's the Spirit of God that raises people from the dead. We don't do that, but we get to be a part of it. We get to be a part of it. So how do we follow the Spirit? What do we do? Let's say two things. One, be in the Word of God. Be in the Word of God. He communicates with us through the, through the word of God. He also won't contradict the word of God. So if you feel like the Lord is leading you to do something and scripture clearly says that, like, don't do that, guess what? That's not the spirit of God leading you. I don't know why I whispered that. It's true. It's not the spirit of God. The spirit of God will, will tell us as we're reading scriptures, you see people uh, run into difficulty and challenges. The more they follow God, it doesn't get easier. It gets harder. You know what the worst day of David's life was? The day he got anointed king. After that, he had to fight giants, go on the run. That was like the worst day ever. Seriously. And a guy dumped oil on your head. Have you ever had oil on you? It's, ugh. it's a terrible day. There's an anecdote that I picked up off the internet, which means it's true. And it's uh, one of the things I learned from playing video games is if things get harder, you're going in the right direction. Thank you, Mario, for your help. But it's true. As you encounter more and more challenges, it's a good indication that maybe you're going in the right direction. Maybe you're following the Spirit of God. He's leading you into challenges and difficulties. I don't think the Spirit of God wants us to be comfortable. The other thing we can do is look to see what we're, what's manifesting itself in our lives. Are we manifesting the fruit of the Spirit? Are you showing fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. If those things are manifesting themselves in your lives, you're walking with the Spirit. If they're not, maybe that's an indication that you're not following the Spirit. You might be going in the direction he's calling, but you might be going about it the wrong way. So look for those. So we pray, we depend on the Spirit. We're also hopeful and expectant. Verse 20, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed. Paul has this unshakable faith, this certainty that this is going to happen. He's full of hope. Now, this isn't, a, this isn't a wishful thinking. This isn't like a pie-in-the-sky dream. This is something he's certain of. I have wishes and hopes. I hope that my wife wins the lottery and I can become independently wealthy. There's two problems with my hope. One is the odds of winning the lottery to that degree are very small. And two, my wife doesn't play the lottery. So like that really reduces our chances. This isn't like that. Paul's talking about something that is certain, that he's determined that's going to happen. He believes, based on Romans 8, 28, that he ironically wrote, all things work together for the good of those that love him, who have been called according to his purpose. He knows that all this stuff is coming together like some master plan to create an opportunity that the Spirit of God is going to make a difference through Paul's life and in Paul's life. His success, his future, his failure, uh, the church... None of that rests on his shoulders. That is the shoulders of the Spirit of God working. And so he's full of hope because the Spirit's all powerful. And so when we look at injustice, we look at Afghanistan and Haiti and plagues, we can be full of hope and expectation too. Because even though, yeah, like we want people to make medical breakthroughs and we want uh, good governments in places and and, and we want uh, houses that can withstand earthquakes and all of that can be contributed to us by us. At the end of the day, it's the Spirit of God we have to trust. We have to count on him to do what he's going to do. So what do you hope for? What are you expecting? Are you expecting comfort? Are you expecting status? Meaning? Because you'll find that, sure. And you'll do everything you can to protect it, but it won't last. But if we hope that Jesus, our Redeemer, our Rescuer, He's going to change the world. He has already changed the world. Now one day he's going to take deserts of depression and disappointment and flooded fields of tears and turn them into gardens. And you won't be disappointed because he doesn't disappoint. So when confronted with overwhelming overwhelming circumstances, one of the first things you have to do is you have to keep that hope and that expectation alive. 
because it's one of the first casualties that, that happens when you face a setback. It's disappointment. It crushes our hope. We have to keep that fire going. I've got to stoke it up. I had a, 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 a busy week, a little bit of difficult week, and just had, had a particular day that was kind of rough and uh, kind of one of those days when you go home and, and you can't leave work at work, right? So you just kind of mull things over in your head and you keep having those same discussions over in your head. I could have said this, should have said that, that didn't do that right. And so I was going to bed that night and it was looking forward to an exciting night of having that same conversation well into the morning of two, three, four o'clock. And so I spent some time in the Word and uh, came across a psalm, don't remember which one it was, uh, but basically it talked about how the Lord uh, is going to uh, take care of you. He's going to speak on your behalf. Not defend, but just speak on your behalf. And he's working even when you're not. And I began to think to myself, I was like, Travis, do you believe that? And I'm not very good at preaching to myself. I, I kind of follow my emotions probably a little too much. And so in that time, in that moment, I was like, Travis, if you believe that, you've got to let this other thing go. And if you can't let it go, then it shows you don't really believe this. And so I kind of preached to myself for a little bit. Kim was asleep, so it wasn't a big deal. And I rolled over and went to sleep. I had a great night's sleep that night. I had a great weekend. It didn't mean I didn't care about it. It didn't mean I didn't even think about it again. But what it meant was it wasn't dominating because I was trusting the Lord to do something. We've got to preach to ourselves. Our emotions will run away with us all the time. Emotions aren't bad. Feelings are good. But they've got to be kept in check. You've got to preach truth to yourself. Go someplace quiet. Go someplace uh, uh, that you, you, people maybe aren't going to hear you. Maybe people that will hear you. And just remind yourself of the gospel. Remind yourself what you trust Christ. Uh, remind yourself of times when he has helped you, when he's uh, uh, taking care of you. Trust him. Preach to yourself. Yell at yourself if you have to. Again, maybe someplace quiet, away from other people. And when all this happens, when all this comes together, this prayer, the depending on the Spirit, this, this hope and expectation, it bubbles over into a thing called worship. And that's the fourth thing, worship. Verse 20, but that with full courage now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. This idea that Christ will be honored, that's worship. That is Paul's primary goal. That's his paramount goal. No matter what he faces, he wants Jesus Christ to be honored, whether he's alive, whether he's dead. That's what it means to live as Christ, is to die as gain. No matter what scenario we're in, whether we're breathing or not, Jesus Christ is glorified. We have hope. And considering we encounter so many uh, daunting trials and difficult places and bad news, Shouldn't we keep the worship of Christ paramount? I mean, Travis, how do, I, how do I do that? Like, what, what do I do when, when I'm faced with something? I don't know what to do. I don't know how to worship Christ. I'm going to give you one question in two parts. Make this like a reflex in your life. When you encounter some kind of news, whether it's a friend, whether it's something on TV, whatever. Two, one question, two parts. What am I good at, and how can I use it to glorify Christ? What am I good at, and how can I use it to glorify Christ? You answer that question, and the Spirit of God will use you immensely. I have a friend of mine who's a good cook. She likes to cook. She had lunch with a friend this week, and her friend was telling her that uh, her, her husband had been diagnosed with some illnesses, and they needed to eat better. And her friend was lamenting the fact that she didn't have time to, to cook any differently right now. So my friend said, hey, I like to cook. I'll make you some vegetables and I'll bring them to you. What am I good at? How can I help? How am I, what am I good at? How can I help? And there's lots of needs here in our church. There are a ton of needs here in our church. A lot of people, because of the rising COVID numbers, had originally volunteered and they've taken a step back. Totally understand. Get it. Do not feel guilty about that at all. But that means there's some of us in this room, and maybe even some of us watching online, who need to step in. We need to serve got to volunteer. We sit there and we watch on TV. We, we see a, a mother holding a Haitian child. And we're like, oh, I just want to wrap my arms around that family. But you won't go hold a kid down in the nursery. Or we sit here and we, we talk about Afghanistan. And we're like, oh, we're worried about the persecuted church. But you won't go over and disciple a student in the student ministry who might one day grow up to be a secretary of state or a diplomat 
And when she's making negotiations, because somebody discipled her, she's like, I'm going to make sure that religious freedom is talked about. And we're going to have countries that have more religious freedom so that churches can be established. And that becomes her primary goal, because somebody discipled her at Park City's Baptist Church. But you know why we won't do it? It's because we're short-sighted. And sometimes we're a little selfish. We're short-sighted. We only want the immediate gains. We don't see what Christ can do over five, 10, 15 years. If you're going to be a worshiper of Jesus Christ, you've got to play the long game. It can't just be the short term. It can't just be the short term. And we are called to worship Jesus Christ. And here's why. Because our world was created good. Our world was created good. It wasn't meant to be a place where billions of people get chewed up so that millions of people can get rich. It wasn't meant to be a place where a disease runs rampant and we can't find hospital beds for people. It wasn't meant to be like that. It wasn't meant to be a place where women are second-class citizens for most of human history. It wasn't meant to be like that. It wasn't meant to be like that. It was good. And you know why it was good? Because God made it. And he put Adam and Eve in the middle of it. And they decided that they wanted to run this thing. They wanted the good world, but without God in it. And they ate fruit and everything kind of collapsed, sin entered the world and there was a curse. And you might say, well, Travis, that's really simplistic. Doesn't make it less true. Because we do the same thing. We want the, perfect, uh, we want the success. We want to make a difference. We want to make an impact, but we want God out of it. There was a scientist, his name was Alfred Nobel. And he made a thing called dynamite. And he was excited about dynamite. We're going to use dynamite to blast holes in rocks and mines and, and be able to do things faster and make trains across the country. And some other people saw dynamite and was like, hey, we can use that to kill people. And it crushed Nobel. He was sad. So much so that he took the money that he got from dynamite and he made an endowment that we now call the Nobel Peace Prize. And he said, I've become death, the destroyer of worlds. And now we argue about who gets the Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah, I don't like his politics. He shouldn't have gotten that. Poor old Alfred Nobel can't get away from conflict. What are we doing? So we still want to do things without Christ as a part of them. But he deserves our worship. And the reason why he deserves our worship is because he made our world, and rather than just throwing it away when it went wrong, Jesus Christ came to earth. He put on flesh he dwelt with our infirmities. He dealt with, with what it was like to be human. He watched friends suffer and die. He buried his adoptive father. And then he went to the cross for me and for you to overthrow death, to overthrow evil, because it wasn't going to be overthrown by, by strength. It wasn't going to be overthrown by, by a military action. It was going to be overthrown by sacrifice. That's what he did. Because his sacrifice was accepted, he was raised to life. And then there's a new heaven and a new earth coming. And those people that are, that are the poor, they're now given a place of honor at the banquet table. Women are no longer objects. They are cherished daughters at the table of the king. There's no longer any need for doctors and nurses because the great physician is here. So y'all all get a long vacation. That's the hope we have. And I can't think of a better picture of this than Jerusalem itself. Jerusalem's always in the news. It's like this place of conflict. It always has been, right? Because it's kind of this crossroads of empires. And so everybody just kind of comes to Jerusalem and people fight over it all the time. We fight over it still. Jews and Christians and Muslims, we're all fighting over it. It's not a place of peace. It's like the worst picture of peace you can possibly imagine. So if you're going to paint a picture of a peaceful situation, Jerusalem is probably not the place you want to go. And then you read Revelation. And you read the end of the book. And John says, And I looked and I saw a new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. Like, what a terrible picture of peace. But it's a great picture of peace, and here's why. Because God doesn't throw things out. He redeems them and he rescues them. And so now Jerusalem becomes a place we all want to go. I want to go to the new Jerusalem so bad. I want Christ to return so bad. This is the hope of believers. We want Christ to return. We want him back. 
And that's when everything gets fixed. And yes, we should work to progressively make things better. Absolutely. We should try to, to make a difference. Let the Spirit of God make a difference through us. But ultimately, everything gets fixed when Christ returns. And you might sit there and say, well, Travis, that seems a long way off. Maybe. Maybe not. Because I have a great aunt. Her name's Catherine. And she's dying of liver cancer. At least we think she is. We just know she's sick and she can't get a, a, an appointment to get an examination because the hospitals are full. But we think she's dying. But a few years ago, Aunt Catherine had a dream. And she dreamed that Jesus Christ told her that she wasn't going to die until he came back. Now, you might sit there and say, well, Travis, that's a little ridiculous. Yeah, maybe. But I hope she's right. Because it doesn't seem like Aunt Catherine has long. And that would be awesome. Because Christ would return. If it's true. I'm not saying it is or it isn't. Do you long for Christ to return? Do you pray for his arrival? Some of us might sit there and say, well, I want to do this before Christ returns. I want to get married. I want to have kids. I want to get this job. I want to be successful. I want to retire. When I was a, a, a young teenager, we would always say in youth group, I want to get married and have sex before Christ returned, right? You're laughing because you know it's true. You said it too. You want to know what that is? That thing that you say, I want to do this before Christ returns, that's your idol. And that's the thing that needs to be torn down. You want Jesus Christ to make a difference in your world, where you are. You keep on praying. You depend on the Spirit. You keep that hope alive and you worship. And then we watch as he works. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, what a blessing it is to not have to worry so much about our God because you love us, because you cherish us, because you're gracious to us, and we know we can run to you with our problems. And Lord, sometimes we believe lies, sometimes we believe false truths that you don't want anything to do with us. You're disappointed. I, I pray that if anybody feels that way when they come to you, they would, you would set that aside. And I pray that if they don't have a relationship with you, you would point that out, you would, you would convict them, Lord, that they would come to know you. But Lord God, we have big prayers today. We have big needs. We pray for peace in places of the world that rarely know peace. Pray for healing in bodies that don't seem like healing's taking hold. Pray for rebuilding in places that seemingly get hit by disaster after disaster. And those are big prayers. But we know that you can do them. We pray them in faith. And we trust you to work even when it seems like Hope is lost. May your name be glorified throughout this world. And Lord Jesus, may you come soon. It's in your name we pray. Amen.